So number one asks us to select all figures for which there exists a direction um, such that all the cross sections taken at that direction would be congruent to each other. So they wouldn't be changing sizes. Um, so we basically want this solid to stay uniform um, from top to bottom and not change size. So I put a bunch of different solids over here. So let's take a look at um, a triangular pyramid. So the triangular pyramid is here. And there's not ever a way that this doesn't get smaller as you go from bottom to top. So this one's cross sections are going to be triangles, but they're going to be getting, um, they're going to be smaller and smaller as you go. So like right here, this cross section would be kind of this size where this cross section would be this size, which is smaller and it would keep going smaller and smaller until you get to a point. So that's going to be true of any pyramid. So triangular pyramid, here's a square pyramid. Okay, the base here is just a square versus a triangle. So these are going to be square cross sections that get smaller and smaller. So that one's not going to be true. And then um, the cone is also very much similar to a pyramid, except for that it has a circular base. So this one has um, the base of a circle and that will just get smaller as you go. Um so cone is going to not be true either. So then let's take a look at um, the rectangular prism. And so the rectangular prism is here. And so a rectangular prism is going to have a rectangle as its base. And so the cross section there is going to look something like that. And the cross section here is also going to look just like that. Okay, and then once we get to the top, still going to be that same size of rectangle all the way through. Um, so this rectangular prism is going to be good. A cube is basically a rectangular prism, but squares on all sides. So it's instead of just a square base, it's going to be a rectangle, or sorry, instead of a rectangular base, it's going to be a square base. And the height's going to be the same length as the sides. So this one will stay squares all the way up. So a cube is good. And then a cylinder, very much the same, except for it has the um, circle as the base again. And then this circle will stay the same size all the way up. And then the last one is a sphere. So here is the sphere. And the sphere actually doesn't have a base, um, but it's got cross sections for sure. And the cross sections are all circles, but they get smaller as you go both up and down. And so those are not going to stay the same either. So um, sphere would be bad as well. Then number two says, imagine an upright cone with its base resting on your horizontal desk. Sketch a cross section formed by intersecting each plane with the cone. Um, and so this one wants a vertical plane, so a straight up and down plane. And so a straight up and down plane through the cone is going to give you a triangle. And this one just wants us to sketch it. So we could just sketch a triangle cross section there. A horizontal plane would be like a flat plane, and that's going to give you a circle, bigger or smaller, depending on um, how high up your plane is. And then a diagonal plane, so cutting across, would give us an oval. Number two, name two figures for which a circle can be a cross section. So we've talked about a few so cylinder is one, and remember a cylinder is two circular bases, stays uniform top to bottom. Um, a cone, which would have that circular base, but then go up to a point. And then a third one, this one only wanted two, but I'll give you three, um, is a sphere, so kind of like a ball. And so all of those would have circular cross sections. 
Number four, sketch the solid of rotation. That would be formed by rotating this two-dimensional figure um, around this vertical line. Um, so remember that rotations are going to be circular because this is going to keep spinning around. So it's going to spin this all the way over to a spot the same distance away. So I kind of like to do this on my paper, just draw some circles to remind me that it's spinning and that it's spinning that distance away, kind of that same distance away, just to give me a little bit of some anchor points um, as to where these things are kind of happening at. And then you can connect them um, and just kind of spin around and get that two dimensional shape. And then you didn't, you could, you know, you don't have to have these in there. So you could just do it like this and then um, draw a sketch. So it should be exactly equal to this thing. Um, but obviously that's not super easy to do. So something pretty similar to it. Number five, draw a two-dimensional figure that could be rotated using a vertical axis. So this vertical axis here um, to create this cone. So you'd have a vertical axis and then you would draw your two-dimensional shape on there, which is just going to be this triangle. So going out to here and then could just be straight attached to um, the vertical axis and then that would rotate around creating that cone. Number five, a regular hexagon and a regular octagon are both inscribed in the same circle. Um, which of these statements are true? So I inscribed some here so we can take a look at it. Um, and why don't I, let me group this and make it just a little bit smaller so we can maybe see it a little bit over here. Um, all right, so the octagon is in orange and the hexagon is in blue. So this one says that the perimeter of the hexagon, the blue one, is less than the perimeter of the octagon. And when they're in the same circle, that's true, okay, because the octagon is widening out. So widening out is going to give it a larger perimeter than the hexagon. Um, and then each perimeter is less than less than the circumference of the circle. Well, the circle is this black circle and these are both inside of it um so i would believe that that is true the octagon is or the hexagon is less than the octagon and then both are less than the circle so now you can read through the rest of these to make sure that they're incorrect if you want to um b says the octagon is less than the hexagon so that's false c says the hexagon is greater than the octagon so that's false D says the octagon is greater than the hexagon, which is true. And then that each of those perimeters is greater than the circle, which is false since they're contained within the inside of that circle. Number seven, determine the perimeter of this figure. Um, so to do the perimeter, we need to know the length of all of the edges. And we know that this... Um, is a parallelogram because we can see that this orange side and this orange side are both perpendicular to the bottom. Um, and so if we draw in, we can kind of cut this into a rectangle. So with this blue base segment here, I can do that exact thing here um, and cut it at a 90 degree angle with this base. So then that would make this 10. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to have this triangle up here so that I can determine um, the length of this piece, okay, because we only know up to here is eight from this side, but we don't know this piece and we don't know the length of this. So we're going to need to use some trig in order to um, find those. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and set up some trig functions to find um, these pieces. So we've got this angle and the side across from it, the 10 is the opposite side. And this piece is the adjacent side. And then this piece is the hypotenuse. So if I use the opposite and the adjacent, that's gonna be a tangent function. So we'll do tangent of 70 
equals the opposite 10 over the adjacent, and I'll call it x. So we'll multiply the x up and get x times tangent of 70 equals 10. Then we'll divide by the tangent of 70. And when we do that, we get, um, so 10 divided by the tangent of 70 is 3.63. Um, or 64 if we round. So this piece right here is 3.64. Then you could do the Pythagorean theorem if you wanted to to find the hypotenuse or you can set up another trig function. So I'm just going to set up another trig function because I think it's faster. Um, so I'm going to do a um, sine function. So sine of 70 equals 10 over the hypotenuse, which I'll call h. We'll multiply the h up and then divide the sine of 70 down. And so we'll get the hypotenuse is equal to 10 divided by the sine of 70, which is 10.64. And so then um, we will, we now have all of the pieces. Um, so let me just change this color here. But this one right here is the 10.64. So now you'll just add up all of those numbers. So we can do 8 plus 10 plus 8 plus 3.64 plus 10.64. And um, we will get, so let's do 10 plus 8 plus 8 plus 3.64 plus 10.64 gives us 40.28. And then this would just be units since it's perimeter dot area. All right, then number eight has us matching trig ratios, um, trig functions to the ratios, and it says we can use them more than once. So this first one has us doing the tangent of A. And remember, tangent is going to be opposite over adjacent. So Y over X for this first one. Um, so Y over X is number four. Then it has us do the tangent of B. So opposite this time is X over adjacent Y. So X over Y, which is the third one. Cosine of A, so cosine is adjacent, which is X, over hypotenuse, which is Z. So X over Z is number two. Um, cosine of B, so cosine of B would be the adjacent is Y, the hypotenuse is Z, so Y over Z. Um, and then sine of A, so opposite over hypotenuse, so Y over Z. And then um, the final one, sine of B, so B, the opposite is X, the, the hypotenuse is Z, so sine would be X over Z. Number nine, explain how we know that these two lines are parallel to each other. So we see this line here and this line here, and we want to say how we know that those two are parallel. So we see a couple different transversals here that cross the two green lines. This transversal has angles marked on it. So this is the one that we're going to want to focus on. And this one, we see this angle here marked congruent to this angle here. Those are um, corresponding angles. So we see that corresponding angles are congruent. That's how we know. So when you were creating parallel lines, you um, translated this. So we have this angle in here. Let me do a different color. Let me do this. So we translated this angle here down, and we know that translations create parallel lines. So when we took this angle and translated it down, 
we ended up with a parallel line. So if you see corresponding angles are congruent, then you know that the two lines are for sure parallel.